you really want like a geeky interaction, stop me, ask me questions. Put your hand up. I'm on the damn list for this thing, so I'm happy to go and ask as much detail as you want. This is meant for an audience who doesn't really care about all the stuff. So, sorry, right, Nick. This is. You know, I just had a. Many hours did I have? Eight hours. I didn't sleep last night. Right? So I came back from my office. And I said, "Oh yeah, I need to finish this thing." So my friend over there, this is the, yeah, he and me <laughs> were hacking this thing to make it work. Uh, you know, and in the rain, the GPS didn't work. So that was like. Uh, what time is it? Nine. Yeah, nine. So that was done, and. That was the bit that I was hoping, okay, I'll get all these things working, I'll see if I can actually show the guys how this works. But now, you know, there's no GPS here, no way or not are we going to see any of those bits here. So that time is wasted. Then I had to write all the slides and all of it. So, for this, so let me start. So, the storyline is something like this. So, the thing in there is... Uh, something beyond this. This is like the API. I will hand this around, but please give all the bits that I gave out back to me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the other part, the mega. So there you go. So I'm going to start with the story of uh, you know, Autocopter. It's the software that goes on it. So generally, when you have a multi-copter, you have normally a bunch of motors, uh, then a battery, and obviously a controller like that. And that controller has a bit of history, and a bit of history behind the code that goes on top of it. The code that goes on it is normally called the Adukopta. So the story is, uh, there are a bunch of guys in the Adu Pilot Mega Group. Uh, they wanted to develop this thing, and uh, there's this... Oh, yes, question for you guys. How many in the audience know Wired Magazine? Put your hands up. Okay, good. How many recognize Chris Anderson? Oh, that's surprising. So he was the editor in chief of my magazine. And he is one of the guys behind our helicopter. So, literally, what happened is he created a community called DIY Drones. The story is more or less around him, uh, all the guys like me and other guys who actually created the community, and uh, kind of a brief introduction to the whole technology and evolution over time. So, that's the structure I've given. So, I'm kind of explaining, you know key characters, key things, and how stuff has happened. And I put some technology in there for the people in the audience who want to know a bit more. And I've actually you know, put enough of information there for anyone who's actually interested to go ahead and do that. So, and I'm happy to help you do that. So the storyline goes, uh, you know, the guys from the Aeroport came together with the guys from the uh, Airport and they created the outcome of this question. So I should probably put my hand up and say I've been associated with this guy. So, you know, what do I say? There's a bias. Okay. So the thing that you're about to see when you get the thing in your hands, that's the leftmost thing. So like, yeah, leftmost thing here. It started out there. So literally, it started out. Started this life as an Arduino board with a, you know, uh, uh, an extra board on there. Literally, that bit. And that board on there actually had all the accelerometers, gyros, and all the rest of the bits. And uh, as things progressed, it took this shape. And uh, you, you can probably see it in the short one. I do have the previous version in here. Let me see if I have the previous version. If I have it, I will put it around so you guys can see it as well. Uh, no, I don't seem to have it yet. Right. Sorry, guys. I have some other controller, but I don't have it. So, who here is uh, familiar with SparkFun? Okay, this is, I'm going to try to explain things then. So generally what happens in open source hardware is like you design something and you go, you know, submit it to SparkFun. SparkFun looks at it and goes, oh, this is interesting. You might actually, you know, make some money out of it. This is actually an open source hardware. So your Eagle files, your bomb, everything will be out there. So you can actually build one and then Everybody else in the world can actually go build their own. This is generally the principle. So this is what happened with ABM, Autopilot Mega. So the first version was released, you know, SparkFun actually supported it. Second version was released, again, the GPS moved out of the board because generally what happens is, as you can see here, right, let me lift it so that you can all see. If you can't see, let me know. So the thingy that's, uh, can anyone see anything? Lighting blue there? 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. So okay. So otherwise, you know, when the talk is over, you can come around and I'll show you a little bit. So there's a thing in there. It's called a big stock. I'm going to talk about it later. So it has all the, uh, you know, electronics in there, meaning not all the sensors. The sensors are the GPS and the actuometers are. Uh, no, so the, the GPS and the compass are over here on this small bit on top. So you want to actually keep it away, as away from uh, other electronics as possible because you know, it, it, you know, it interferes with other things. So we realized that we moved it out. So when you get the small piece of plastic, you will see there are you know, things saying I square C, GPS, etc. So it's all the sensors going down. So this is like a very simple uh, block diagram kind of describing how a normal flight controller works. I mean, even though the talk is more or less aimed towards uh, multi-copter, I meaning things with multiple propellers, you can actually have a fixed version, fixed wing version. So essentially you have a wing and uh, you control the three or four channels on how many channels you want. So the, principle, the code base is different because the uh, computation that you do is uh, for the two sets of things are slightly different. Meaning, uh, you actually have three axes uh, like this. So imagine you are on the north pole and you are you, you are looking upwards. So you have like three axes x, y, z. This actually gives you the orientation for a normal multicopter. So you do all your multiplications by DCM based on that. So it's like relative orientation based on that. And that's slightly more complicated than a normal plane. Plane is like you know you have a and X and a Y, you don't actually do too much on Z straight away. So it's like you don't do that straight. So you know, the things keep you in the air. That's the assumption. We still have the assumption go to the window, but that's not only the assumption. So I was trying to explain this uh, at a high level. So if you look at it, it's very much like a simple human. It's like, sorry, all humans, right? You have a stability system. If you get really drunk, you will notice it. The stability <laughs> system doesn't work. And then you have difficulty walking around. So there's a part of the brain called cerebellum, and it actually controls all the things. There are sensors actually designed in the unit. Oh, it's actually, yeah, that's fine. It's complaining about it. it's not working. If it's not being used for a long time, then it's not complaining. That's a very bad idea. So in your unit here, that's uh, actual windows in there. So it actually recognizes when you rotate. Recognizes that it's called cochlea, and there are a whole bunch of things in there that actually does that. So there's a bunch of circuit in between the two years. Apparently, that's where all the computation happens. And then you have all your actuators, like your legs and your arms. So if you think of it, you have a similar structure. You have a uh, you know a transmitter because you need to talk to them. So I am talking to you. So if I ask somebody to actually get up, essentially it's me transmitting and you receiving by a year, then it goes to your brain and the brain computes, and you walk up and you know, get up. It's a whole same concept. The other bits that are there is the GPS because it doesn't recognize where it is by its own. So it looks at all the satellites and kind of recognizes where it is. Then there's this, what I would call the IMU. IMU essentially has uh, the combination of both the accelerometers and the gyros. So if you have three axes, so if you could recognize uh, acceleration on each of the axes, and if you integrate it twice, you get the distance. Integrate it once, you get the velocity. So literally using just that, you can get you know where you are. I mean, our brain does the same thing. So even if you close your eyes and then you wave your hand, you kind of get an idea where we are. That's the same principle. We don't recognize it ourselves, but loosely speaking, the same principle. Right. Uh, okay. Now we're going to do a uh, okay, slightly more detailed version. You want me to go through this, or should I skip? You can vote. You say yes, I'll do that. No, I'll skip it. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, so, as I was saying, there's three axes, and each of the axes will have one gyro or one accelerator. Uh, accelerometer. So, gyros is quite trivial. Uh, who in this room has not uh, has used a bicycle? Right, so everybody knows the effect of gyro, right? So when you bike, if you try to rotate it, when you bend it, it, you know, it, has, it shows resistance. It tries to stay itself, like, like, like that. So that's the principle. So it's like, if you have a wheel, and it is rotating at very, very high speeds, and then you try to rotate it in this direction, it resists that, and tries to put it, straight, put it straight. So that's actually being used here. It's like you can actually have, imagine three of those things. I'm just simplifying it. The way it's being done is slightly different. 
because the scales of doing it is very, very small. If you want to have a large wheel, you know, it doesn't go in there. So you have to use minutes of, you know, minutes of manufacturing. So that's essentially what happens. And uh, if you think of, uh, you know, accelerometers, the easy way to do is what they like as a pendulum. So, you know, if you're on a tube and in the tube breaks, you go forward, right? The distance you go forward is like a function of how fast the train was going and how quickly it's stopping. So this is essentially what an accelerometer does. So that's that bit, because all those bits are kind of in an analog world, and your microcontroller. Okay, uh, again, question for you guys. Uh, who in the room has heard about uh, CPUs and microcontrollers and things like that? Okay. okay, that's good. So, of course, I don't have to explain any of those bits. So it can actually take all the stuff straight through, and it can actually take things in, meaning it can actually take information in. So. I got a 3DR radio to actually connect to my my controller here, so I can actually send some information, and I can actually show you that the GPS doesn't work. So otherwise, I can show you how to set waypoints. Everything could be done straight through, and it'll go through there. Uh, then GPS is there, the RC receiver. So when you have a RC transmitter, uh, the receiver here will receive it, and it will give it to all the channels. Question at the bottom. Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm gonna wait. No, he said, he said he would take questions if anything yeah, came up. Okay. Go for it. Do you have a question? No, I need a CD. I need a Linux live CD. Oh, sorry, I think you're in the I wrong room. Tell me. My previous uh, statement about you being in the North Pole and looking upwards. So if you look downwards, you are directly at the center. But when you move across like that in the same altitude, actually your you know, degree, I mean, your angle that you cut with the center of Earth is going to change. That's called precision. So what you're trying to do is you want to correct that. So you would actually use multiple sensors. So in addition to actually using your gyros, you will actually use your accelerometers, your magnetometers, and your GPS. So it's like, you know, try as many as you could. So you can actually remove the error. That's that's that approach. So I have a, a block diagram for big rock, and I'll try to explain it a bit more better then. So uh, it's essentially quite simple. As I said, uh, you know, you have all the, all the sensors, does some compute, and has all the motors. So the motors actually spin up, and it actually causes this thing to fly in the air. I can't actually do that now. Uh, so right. So this is again. For the people who are really interested in understanding how things happen, so the simplest way of describing it is manual. You do whatever you know this thing does it. So you use your RC transmitter and you you ask it to go high, it will go high. With civilization, it's like for people like me who are not very good at flying. So you turn the tone, and if you do something silly, you just recognize ah, this guy is being silly. Let me stop that from happening, and it will keep itself. Right, uh, altitude hold is like you, you set it up. Uh, you need to have GPS, otherwise it, it gets a bit flaky. Essentially, the problem with what he was describing, the errors that accumulate over time, it actually makes you drift. So if you have GPS and other bits, then you can actually stay on time. Uh, then geofencing is the most interesting bit. So you actually use. Let's see if I can actually. No, there's no <coughs> GPS, so I can't show you that bit. Uh, so effectively, you can go use kind of Google Maps kind of thing and kind of describe where you want the uh, box to be. So you could describe points on a box so the copter stays inside it. So anytime you fly within it, it won't do anything to you. So you can do whatever you want to do. This is a cool feature. So say uh, you know, you're not sure of your flying skills, you create a geofence, assuming there's GPS, you create a you know, geofencing, you create a box that's like you know, 10 meters or 20 meters about from the ground and a fly inside, right? If it goes upside down, it has to be high enough for it to correct. So it will flip itself and stay when it reaches the boundary. So that's an interesting feature. Well, all the rest of it is kind of uh, normal stuff. It actually does the auto autonomous takeoff and landing. Uh, assuming there was a GPS and everything else is working, I could have shown you how that happens. It literally takes off, flies, and lands. Uh, do I have the video? No, I don't have the video. Okay, so the things I was saying, uh, it's just there now, it's kind of silly, you can actually see. So you set waypoints here and you can actually see whatever you want to do, you can do. So generally what happens is when you have uh, 
uh, not decoupled like this. You want to control it, and you want to control it with your transmitter. And sometimes what you want to do is you want to control it with your laptop or your iPad or your iPhone, not iPhone, because Android fully has that app. So you have two options. This is called the mission planner and the APM planner. You can get either one of those things. This is for uh, Alucopter and uh, Pixstock. So you could set all these things up and you can actually monitor where it's going and you can actually set all those things that I said before over here. So this is the simplest way of describing it. That's the last block over there. Right, okay. Now, I was talking about APM. Oh, where's my APM stack? Right. So this is now kind of history because this doesn't really have a total 32-bit floating point and all the rest of the bits. So you have a lot of restriction. And the amount of memory on here is small, and the amount of code that has gone in is almost reached the limit. So there's no more space for anything to be done. So the guys in the so-called community started looking for other open source or open <coughs> hardware, open source hardware, right? And then they came upon, uh, across this one. It's called Pixoc. Uh, let me see, where's my Pixoc? Sorry. Right, I'll, I'll take it out later and I'll show you, I'll show you those things. So uh, the, the, the initial bit of hardware came out of ETH Zurich. And you might have seen some of the cool videos from the ETH guys. Some of the uh, dancing, uh, you know, multicopters and things like that. They have a very, very, very active group. And they had this piece of, soft, uh, piece of hardware and a piece of software that was there. And it was open source. And uh, it came with like two sets of adapters, one for the normal multicopter and one for drones, AR drone. And that was a cool bit. Everybody was interested in that bit. So, you know, there was a, a whole bunch of interest and people decided to actually adopt it. So, uh, the big shock thing was created. So, instead of actually having two boats, everything was put into one, you know, one box like that. It's actually in there. And, uh, Okay. What's the difference between a multi-cup and a drone? Oh, no difference, literally. I just call it a drone. If you actually have the ability to fly on your own, you can call it a drone. Okay. It's, it's called a multi because it's much more popular. So, yeah. so this is the box in which it comes, but I took it out and it's in there. So this is the big shock thing. Both the boards that are there, the PX4 and the adapter board, is put on a single single enclosure in that sense, and it's called big shock. So, okay, a bit of technical stuff. I thought I would hand wave uh, because you might ask me why do you want to do this given you already have like a very cheap, the price difference is like quite a bit between this and that. And there's a reason why it's so, it's like this is an Arduino based one and um, I think it runs like 32, 16 or 32 AI. It's like doesn't really do much, but whereas this one is like 168. I think this is. PX4 version is actually 168. I think the Pixel version is even faster, and uh, it has a proper uh, you know, operating capability. So you can actually set up, you know, waypoints all across the globe rather than just like short distances. So like, if it's eight, eight bit, the distance you can actually have is very short. So it has other bits as well. Uh, if anybody's interested, but I think there's nothing there that's of any interest. If there are any proper geeks and want to know something, ask me and I will explain what that is. So essentially, it has all the interfaces that uh, other other and Mega had. Uh, it had an, has an extra bit, which is a buzzer, which you all heard go off when I booted it. Then uh, it has like a whole bunch of PPM, RC controller inputs and uh, PWM outputs. And then there are two i squares here outputs as well. And that's more or less it is. Right, this is the architecture. Um, so, right, so I'm about to say something. Which, uh, okay, so if you, sorry, it's for you over there, you ask the question. So if you look over here, you could actually see, you know, all, all the estimation gets fed back. So you actually have all the extra sensors. There's, I have an optical flow sensor with me, but I haven't connected it, and GPS module, and all those things, so you actually get the feedback, so you can actually have your connection on there. So this is like a full architecture, uh, overall architecture. The thing about uh, Big Shock is already, it supports a RC protocol called Madlink. So you could actually run your machine and you can connect back to Big Shock 
and you can actually do a whole bunch of things, not just the stuff you could actually do on APM. So you, all the videos that you actually see on ETH Zurich website is more or less them using Mavlink to con you know, connect and control and do all the compute on a different place. It could be on the cloud. So uh, I thought I should mention this. Uh, so who here doesn't use Kickstarter? <laughs> right, OK. Oh, you? OK, right. So there was a project that was there called Hexo Plus. <coughs> so this was for a drone that will actually track you and actually take you know, uh, videos or pictures of you while you do a base activity. And the thing is, like, the team, uh, now it's public, so I can tell you, yeah, because I found uh, Chris Anderson tweeting about him meeting the Hexo Plus team, so I could confidently say this, because I, was, I wasn't sure whether I could say it, because I, I've been talking to these guys, and uh, you know, I was looking at various ideas of how this could be done, because it's just a two-axis stabilization system, a big shock, and uh, they are trying to use an app on a phone to actually you know, track the movement. So essentially, you know, if you have an app on a phone, and then you, you kind of do a follow me. So essentially what happens is when you're GPS and your accelerometer gives you the, all the feedback, or all the data, it goes through on the phone, connects back to the thing in the air, and it, it tries to uh, catch you up. That's essentially what it does. And your two axis essentially does the tracking. Minimal tracking. It's not a true tracking, but a minimal tracking. So, you know, for the people who are not really, you know, tech savvy, this is one of the things. Because the videos for those were really, really cool. And I just wanted to show you guys this is the technology behind it. Yep, and uh, this bit is if you really get interested. Okay, if you really get interested and if you want to really get started. So, 3D Robotics is a bunch of guys. So the the DIY drones community, which I was talking about, I have a bit more slides over there. Uh, they actually became well organized and uh, they got a bit of money, which I will talk about a bit later. And uh, they started manufacturing all those things. It's still open source hardware, so essentially you or I can actually go uh, you know, build our own. So nobody's going to stop us from actually building a clone. Meaning, literally, you have all the specs out there, you take it and you build your own, right? Uh, there are a couple of distributors in the UK. There's Unmanned Tech and Build Euro Drones. Uh, you, could, you, know, you could go to the website and you can order a big stock. And then once you get that thing, you could uh, look at the, there's a quick stock guide. Kind of tells you what to do. Doesn't take that long, if you be careful. That long in the sense like, you know, if you were to build everything from scratch and configure everything, uh, you know, we put somewhere between two to four hours for uh, an initial configuration to get everything right and, and get in the air, right? Uh, and there is like a, a dev resource there, and uh, that's even more cool. You can actually have some of the code bit, a uh, code bit which the Hexo Plus guys actually build their thing on. So actually, there's like a code, code code bit that allows you to track things from a camera on something and use the drone to follow. So if you're really interested, you know, you should probably have a look. And, It'll take you a long way there. So uh, I'm going to give you a quick intro to open source software. So I'm sure you recognize the guy on the right. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. He's, I've been only for like three plus years. Both the guys are really, really nice guys. Uh, you know, I think it's the community things. Like if somebody doesn't really do a proper job, I guess the community would get around and kick them. That's generally what I've noticed. So I ended up actually you know, creating a meetup group just because I was here and I didn't have a large number of people. As I was saying, in the US, there's a whole bunch of people who are interested in doing things. And in the UK, we only have a very small community. And we don't really look at geeks in the way people in the valley look at them. Do you guys agree or am I making a? It's like, you're not cool. We are never considered cool. If you walk into a room and you say, you do X many things, they look at you and go, oh, it's a freak. I should not do it. <laughs> but you go to the valley, I, I do that quite often. Uh, I spend a bit of time there, do various things there. If you walk up to somebody and say, oh, I do this, and I do this, and I do that, and I do that, oh, cool. So do you know you can actually do this and this? And you go, yes. And that's how the conversation starts. You go into a room and you say, you do this and you do that, and the guy goes, this guy is showing off. 
But it's not the case. It's the fact that you know you build rapport with other people who actually do the same. So you can actually collaborate. If you go in the valley and you say that to people, people are really smart. They will come up to you and say, hi, uh, I'm actually doing this. Do you want to work with me? I've actually had lots of people do that to me. People from Stanford, people from MIT, you know. So when you say people, are you referring to the basically the rich people who work for Google or the rest of the people who live in San Francisco who do not work with these very well? Oh, you don't place to go. There's a big class thing going on. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Google, okay, the set of people who work for Google don't actually have major products on the side. Okay, they have small products. I actually work on Yo-Yo, you know, Ayo, Ayo. The guy actually used to work for Google in Israel. He moved across from Madden U. I still work with him. I mean, there is a class of people, inside, even inside Google, I can tell you that, right? Who don't actually, you know, act like Google, think like Google, or... That's true of Microsoft. I used to work for Microsoft Research. I can assure you, you know, a large enterprise has you know, a mainstream thinking and a whole bunch of other people who don't really subscribe to the whole thing. And of course, there are, you know, if you, I don't know how, how familiar you are with the valley, but if you go there in the valley, if you talk to anyone who works for any startup, you can almost be sure that they are geeky and they appreciate what geekiness means. And they really understand the so-called uh, you know, bootstrap attitude of you know, uh, you know, so-called hackers to get things done. So you, you probably won't have all the money or all the things that you have at one point of time to have a project. So what you do end up doing is you, you start cannibalizing things you have, like you know, things lying around the house, or you know, you ask your friends, and that's essentially the whole you know attitude I've seen. And the thing I noticed in the UK is like you probably are not really very welcome asking people to get have hardware lying around the house. I don't know, maybe I know. So, uh, there's an interesting book which actually Chris wrote. It got so, this is the book. So, it actually describes uh, the community building that I was talking about and how we ended up actually doing uh, the 3D robotics. It's an interesting journey. The storyline is something like this uh, there was a guy called Jody, he's a Mexican. Uh, he didn't have a book. He married somebody American. He moved across to the US. He didn't actually have a proper job. So he was uh, very much interested in building drones. Uh, he had built, you know, the wee nunchuck thing. So there's an accelerometer inside it. He, he took it out, put it on an Arduino board. Uh, there was a YouTube video produced. Chris was doing the same using Lego blocks. He, he talked to this guy, and I can assure you, he treated him really well. It's like, that's the other thing I noticed. It's like, there's no such thing as, okay, I'm a big dude, and you're a small fry. No, that doesn't happen. At least, that's from all the things I've seen, that doesn't happen that, that much. So it's like you're considered more or less the same. If you know what you're talking about, you're considered a peer. And uh, I'm already breaking rules. Like I'm using a lion one five mega slick, which is illegal. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so my four thirty three doesn't work. It's in here. It doesn't work. So if they come in, I'll say I'll just pull it out and I'll go. All right, I'm using it. That's that, that's a four thirty three one. It doesn't really. I didn't get time to get the comments. So that's. Okay, that's the answer you hold for this. Yeah, so on that mode, it'll actually fly on its own. You set everything up, off it goes. And when it fails, it'll come back and land. So in theory, that's what it is. And you just keep track of all the, you know, telemetry, as you can see on this slide. You know, it'll tell you Look at this, minus one person. So, uh, you know, it'll tell you all the details that you want to do. In automatic mode, yeah. just collision avoidance? Oh, no, there's no collision avoidance right now. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. So, it means no, like, you're a or something? Absolutely nothing. Okay. Uh, it does nothing. <laughs> all it does right now. I mean, I'm telling you the honest truth. Mm -hmm. like, I know the code base recently, so I can tell you that. There's nothing there right now. A lot of people are interested, but the problem is. Okay, you can use LUDAS, and uh, the price point for LUDAS is a bit high. So, uh, who here has seen Google Glass? Okay, right. You know the thing on the top? Uh, that's a LUDAR, 64 days of LUDAR from Melodyne. So, I met the guys from uh, Melodyne like last year, because I was impressed with them looking for a small LUDAR that they have, 16 days of one. See how heavy it is, and, and there was like a meetup group in San Francisco Bay Area when I was there. Uh, so we could attach it and see if we could 
Google Slam. Uh, price is a huge problem. So it's like it's very pricey. I think it's like 64 gig or something like that for the the one that uh, Google Cloud has on the dollar. So something like that will be useful.